1 Corinthians chapter 11 is where we're going to be today. Obviously, as you can, as you can tell, um, this is one of the Sundays we select each year to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper, what we call the Lord's Supper, communion, whatever you may call that. But today we're, we're here to, to celebrate that. And, and actually, usually once or at least once a year, I, I like to take the entire message time to really focus on that because I think so many times we just kind of tag it on at the end or, or whatever that we lose the significance of why we're here and why we celebrate the Lord's table. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come together for that at the end of our time in just a little while. But I, I want to look at Paul's writing about the Lord's Supper. In, uh, really and truthfully, it's the only time in Scripture that it's called the Lord's Supper is, is when Paul calls it that right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But coming together, you know, I, I, I was laughing, and I don't mean to be uh, disrespectful to anybody, but, you know, the letter to Corinth, well, really both letters, but especially the letter of 1 Corinthians, you know, Paul doesn't have a lot, a lot of really good things to say to the church, does he? I mean, he, he's kind of, this is kind of a, a full letter of rebuke, of, of, of telling them me what they're how they're missing the mark or some things they're not doing wrong. And I always laugh because I say, I, I don't know if I would ever want to be a church, if I was starting a church, that, w- that it would name it Corinth Baptist. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, or Corinth Church because it's like, you know, you kind of, you set yourself up to be a church that doesn't do things right. I mean, I, I don't know if that's what you're wanting to do or not, but I know a lot of churches that have the, the name Corinth uh, in their name and, and whatnot. A lot of them are really really good churches. But, you know, as we think about this letter, there really is a lot of uh, things that Paul addresses that are uh, difficulties, that are um, struggles that the church at Corinth is dealing with. And as he does that, there's a couple of different places in this text, and one of them is the very first verse of chapter 11, which is really not part of our text today, but it, it is a part of uh, what we want to, to look at this morning. Paul makes a couple of statements. He says, first of all, Early on in his letter to the Corinthians, he says, as he's writing to them, he says to the Corinthian church, I don't really want to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul understood who he wanted to be. He understood the way he wanted to live his life. So much so that at the beginning of chapter 11, I don't know that I would ever have the the intestinal fortitude, I guess you could say it, to make this statement. But I guess it's just Paul's determination. Paul's strength of mind and character. And he said in the very first one verse, uh, verse of chapter 11, Paul says, talking to the Corinthian church, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. Paul says to the Corinthian church, he's been, he's been letting them have it for several chapters. He's been, and we're just getting ready to get into the spiritual gifts and all that kind of stuff. We're really going to chastise them a little bit more. But he says, if you want to know how to live the Christian life, if you want to know what it means to follow Christ, watch me. Wow. That, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? Now, Paul, don't, I know some people think, some people like to, Paul thinks he's getting arrogant. No, Paul's not getting arrogant or anything right there. What Paul is saying is, I know where I'm headed. I know what my goal in life is. I know what I want to do with my life. And my life is going to be about one thing. That's following the Lord Jesus Christ. Did Paul do a lot of other things? Yes. We know he was a tent maker to help make, his, make ends meet while he traveled around being an evangelist. We know that he did a lot of other things and planted churches. But he was foremost of anything. He was a follower of Jesus Christ. And he said, follow me as I follow Christ. So Paul is teaching the Corinthian church. He's telling them. And then he goes on in the very first half of chapter 11 to talk about uh, several aspects that were going on in the church, several things that need to be corrected, several things that needed to be done or they weren't doing or how they should properly be done. And then he gets over to verse 17. He begins to give a, a, a quite lengthy teaching about what we're going to do in just a moment in celebrating the Lord's Supper. But they did it a little differently back then, and we'll share that in just a second. But I want to read this together, and I, I would ask you, if you would, to stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. As we begin in verse 17... Is Paul's giving instruction to the church, and now he shifts to this instruction. He says, but in giving this instruction, as he continues to give instruction to the church, he says, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. 
For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What do you have? Why do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was, he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after su- supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep or have died. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Help us as we just understand what it means to come to your table together as your church, as your family, and give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. As we think about this passage of Scripture, we think about what's going on here. We think about what the Apostle Paul is teaching. He, first of all, he gives a little chastisement in the, in the, in the first part. And actually, what I call a little bit of a, a rebuke. So we, we first see a, a rebuke. Says, Paul says, when I'm giving this instruction, I'm not coming right now to praise you. I can't come and praise you because the practice in which you're doing looks way too much like what the world does. In other words, when he comes in to say this, he says, you have to understand the, the early, early church practice. They didn't just come together like we do and have a worship service and singing and then have a little bread, have a little wine, a little juice, whatever, and, and then go about their business. When they came together, they had a feast. They called them love feasts, actually, and, and they would end that love feast with the Lord's Supper. But a common practice in that day among just everyday life and out in the, the, normal, out in the everyday world would be for the people who were wealthy, people who had privilege, the people who had more, they would eat first. And anybody who was poor or didn't have as much, they, got to, they, had, they had to wait to the last. They kind of pushed their way to the front of the line. And, and, it said, and what Paul's rebuking here is, is you come together to supposedly take of the Lord's Supper together, but what you're doing is, is you're doing exactly like you do in your homes. And Paul said, look, do you not have homes to eat in? Can you not go home and, and have a meal? He says, why in the world would you treat people inside the church the same way you treat them in the world? So we, we, you know, even though this isn't a modern practice of what we do, we can take the principle of what Paul is teaching here and we can apply it because what he's saying is the church where you come together as the people of God in, in, a, in the place of worship, whether it was in someone's home or whether it was in a, a temple or, or whether it was somewhere else, because in this day they didn't have a lot of churches. They were probably meeting in someone's home or, or, or just outside of someone's home as they came together to do this. They would have this feast together. He says, you shouldn't be the same when you're gathered together as my people as you are when you're in your home. In other words, you, you probably shouldn't be doing this in your own home, but hey, that's your own practice. If you're in your own home and you do that, that's, that, that's, that's your decision. But when you come to my house, there's a way that things ought to be done, and I can't praise you because you've brought way too much of the world into my house. You brought way too much of the way you do things on the outside into this place. And when you come to the house of God, guess what? Everybody's equal. Doesn't matter how much money you have or how little money you have. Doesn't matter how much education you have or how little education you have. Doesn't matter what, uh, where you're from or, 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 or what family you're a part of. It doesn't matter. Those things don't matter anymore because when you come to the cross, guess what? Everybody's on equal ground. When you come to the house of God, God treats everybody the same. Whether you have much or you have little, whether you know much or know little, God treats everyone the same. He says, I give you this instruction 
When you come together at church, he says, I hear that there are divisions that exist among you. And he says, in part, I believe it. Now, Paul was getting this information secondhand. He had not been there to observe this, but he had gotten it from reliable sources. And he says, I believe it, and and it shouldn't be so. Can I tell you something, folks? Until the church comes together, until the church is moving in the same direction. And and when I say the church, I, I do mean our local assembly. But I mean all the churches. That's why Wednesday night we're going to gather together with other churches to worship and come together. Churches of different denominations, churches of different, they they do things differently than we do. We do things differently than they do. But we're coming together to worship. Why? Because it is important that the testimony of the church is accurate. That the testimony of the church is pure and that there's not divisions among us. The last thing we need to do is be out there in the world criticizing someone in our church or someone from another church because they do things differently than we do. What the world needs to listen, the world hears enough division. The world hears enough brokenness. The world hears enough uh, of all this stuff. So Paul's rebuking the church saying these divisions should not exist among you. He said, but I believe they're there. And the reason they're there is because some of you want to be approved or you want to prove who you are. And Paul says that doesn't matter. He says when you come together for the Lord's Supper, some of you are eating in abundance. You're going, you're going first, and you're eating, you're, you're eating in abundance. You're, you're even getting drunk. You're drinking so much of the, the, the wine that you're getting drunk. And then you've got people who come behind you who don't get anything, who have nothing. He said this thing ought not to be so. Church, can I just say today, as we come together at the Lord's table this morning, that we need to come together in unity. Part of one of the greatest things about the Lord's table is we come together, no matter what your background is, no matter what your denomination is, when we come to the Lord's table to remember who Jesus is, to remember what he did, we come together in unity. When Jesus was praying right before he went to the cross, the thing that overwhelmed him in his prayer in the Gospel of John was what? Lord, may they be one. May they be one as we are one. Jesus understood something. If we can't come together in unity in the church, how in the world are we going to be effective in the world? He calls us to unity. He calls us to think more highly of others than we think of ourselves. He calls us together to put our desires and our wants aside for the need and the desire of others. That's the whole point. When he talks about the Good Samaritan, when we talk about servanthood in the scriptures over and over and over again we see this same process we see the same idea that those divisions are not supposed to be there the things of the world are not supposed to be there we shouldn't people shouldn't come into the church and hear arguing and fussing and bickering and fighting they should come to the church and feel and sense the love of God through his Holy Spirit and the person of Jesus Christ that's what they ought to experience when we come into worship we should come into worship him not worship ourselves we come in here because We are united around the cross of Jesus Christ. Listen, if we're here for any other reason than to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords, we're here for the wrong reason. And that's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, you're about to to do something that the Lord Jesus Christ himself told us to do. We We can't be more in the will of what God wants us to do than we are when we come to his table because he said... And Paul goes into it. He received it from the Lord. You see, he rebuked them. But then he called them to remember. He called them to remember like Jesus did. He called them to say, verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you, and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me, and verse 26 is key. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, look at this last verse, this last phrase, you proclaim, you preach the Lord's death until he comes. Now, what's so important about that? The importance is every time we gather together, we got to remember, he said, just as he received from the Lord. Now, we don't know if, if Paul received this, if Jesus directly told him and taught him this or whether he got this from the disciples because obviously he came along after and gave his life to, he was, when he met the Lord on Damascus Road, was well after Jesus had instituted this. So we don't know if Jesus in that teaching time 
revealed this directly to Paul or whether he got this from, from the disciples or someone else. But we know this. He says, as I received it from the Lord, I'm telling you, this is one of the most important things we do. <laughs> I know, unfortunately, uh, it's kind of become commonplace in churches. Some churches do the Lord, observe the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Um, some denominations do it every week. Some, like us, do it about three to four times a year. Uh, others do it maybe monthly. Uh, there's no rhyme or reason. Jesus didn't prescribe how often. He just said, as often as you do. As often as you do, do what? Remember. Remember what? Remember what I did for you. You see, we come to this time so many times in a somber way. We come to this, this table and we, you know, we're kind of reverent. And uh, Listen, I'm going to tell you, that is far from what the early church did. When the early church came to this, it was a party. It was a celebration. It was raucous. It was wild. Uh, and I'll tell you what, it was something they, because rem- they were remembering exactly what Jesus had done. You know, we sang a song a moment ago, and Zane and I didn't talk about it. I don't know if he, I don't know if he even thought about this. Uh, he may have, he may not have. We didn't really talk about it. But that song, Oh Happy Day, there could not be a more perfect song to sing on the day that you do communion than oh happy day because i'm going to tell you what when i come back to here it reminds me of everything jesus did for me it reminds me where i was and where i am it reminds me who i used to be and who i am now and and it reminds me who one day i might be because i'm not where i need to be yet i'm not one of those that can stand up and say watch me as i you know follow me as i follow christ i'm not one that says hey take a look and be an imitator of me most of you would probably say uh we'll pass i mean that that's just one of those things i understand because i'm still a work in progress and guess what so are you and so was paul paul wasn't saying that early on because he thought he was perfect Paul wasn't saying that because he thought he had achieved some higher standard than everybody else. He just had a mind that was fixed and set on what he was going to do. And he said, if you want to know even close to what it looks like, watch me because I'm going in that direction. I'm going with him. I'm not going in the other directions. I'm not going to be distracted by the things of the world. You see, the beauty of what we just read, we proclaim the Lord's death it's not just the Lord's death, it's the Lord's resurrection, which the Lord's death and his resurrection is what? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, which shows me that Jesus himself, God in the flesh, came. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The only person in the history of the world and ever in the history of the world that will be that didn't deserve to die. Took on death for me. So that I wouldn't have to know death, but I could have eternal life. It's the gospel. When we come to the table, we are remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made. We, were, we are remembering, when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he's not saying, remember this night. He's saying, remember what I'm about to do. Those disciples that first night did not have a clue what was about to happen. As a matter of fact, right after that, I'm sure they probably had some thoughts for about three days thinking, what in the world did he mean? Why does he want us to remember this? These are the worst days of our life. We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was the one who came to liberate us, and now he's gone. Why in the world would he want us to remember this? It wasn't until day three. It wasn't until that morning. You know, the Bible tells us that sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. On that first Sunday morning, when the Marys went to the tomb to anoint his body because they just couldn't figure it all out. And the stone was rolled away, and the angel told them, you, you, you're, why are you here? You're looking for the living among the dead. And they went back and got the disciples, and later on Jesus met them in the room, in the upper room. And then he met with them over the next 40 days many times and talked to them and taught them, and they watched him as sin. Do you think then it changed They remembered when he said, do this in remembrance of me. Do you think it changed their perspective? Absolutely it did. Why? Because they understood what he said at that point. They understood that that Isaiah 53, suffering servant, had come. Even though that passage of Scripture had, had really bewildered them for a long time, they realized that it was talking about the Messiah, it was talking about Jesus. And now when they come, and they come together and they eat the bread, and they drink the juice, or they're proclaiming something. 
They're proclaiming my identity with Jesus. They're proclaiming my victory in Jesus. They're proclaiming my life in Jesus. And that's what he's telling us to do today as we come to this table. It's not to, to oh, be so somber and sad. It's to rejoice because he's alive. And he's alive forevermore. Never to die again. And listen, and the mo- guess it, just get this for a minute. The moment you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, guess what? You are alive forevermore from that moment. Do we understand that eternity is not something we wait for? Eternity is something we enjoy right now. Yes, this physical body is going to go away. Unless Jesus returns and takes me home to be with him. Yes, this physical body is going to, I mean, it's already decaying. I know it doesn't look like it, but it is. (laughs) I'm kidding. It's a joke. Y'all can laugh. I know I told some of you not to laugh in church, but it's okay. It's decaying. It's going away. But one day it'll be renewed. One day it will be renewed in a way. Well, my spirit's already been renewed. That's the battle that goes. That's the battle that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 7. When he said, why is it I always don't do what I know I should do and I do what I know I shouldn't do? Anybody else relate? Yeah, a few of us can. At least, at least two of us is honest in here. Um, you know, a few of us can relate to that, right? Because the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Because when the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, or 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that, that everything's a new, that I'm a new creation, the whole, old things have passed away, all things have become new. I don't know about you, my, my outer body didn't change. My flesh didn't change. My inner man changed, and he's still changing, and he's renewed, he's redeemed, but I battle my flesh every single day just like you do but thankfully because of what happened on that night because of what we're about to remember we can celebrate then paul moves on as he tells them to as he rebukes them and he tells them to remember he also tells them to reflect and to to reflect on their own life he says therefore whoever eats or the, the bread or drinks the cup of the lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the lord but a man must examine himself and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup now uh and he goes on to talk about that if we'll do that and we'll judge ourselves rightly, that we won't be judged. But many people had not judged themselves rightly, and because of that, there were many that were sick in the congregation, and, and some had even died because of it. But he tells us if we'll judge ourselves, we won't be judged. But if we are judged, we're disciplined by the Lord. In other words, the Lord will show us where we need to be correct. The Lord will show us what we need to change in our life. But uh, you know, for so long, I've, I've preached this, and Many preach it. I don't think it's a wrong way to preach it, but we, we take this as an introspective look. I'm not sure that this is exactly what this passage is talking about. I think we should look and examine ourselves, but I think he's not talking about necessarily to, we, we, we hear this talk about the time, well, you need to make sure there's no unconfessed sin in your life before you take this or you might get sick. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and I don't think that's what he's saying at all. I think that's a portion of it. We should always look at ourselves. But I think he's saying, look at why you're doing this. Examine yourself. Are you partaking in a, in a manner that is honoring to the Lord? Are you taking it in a manner that's honoring to other people? Are you doing this in a way that's not uh, creating division and distraction, but is create, creating unity and joy and happiness and bringing people together? He says, examine yourself. As you examine yourself, judge yourself. Judge how you're looking at the Lord. Judge how you're coming together. Are you coming together just saying, hurry, let's hurry up and get this over with so I can get home? Or are you coming together saying, I'm here to worship and adore the Lord of lords and the King of kings, the one who gave his life for me, the one who sacrificed everything for me? When we come to church, why are we here? Are we here because it's just something we do and we check it off our list and go home? Or are we here to truly learn and grow? Because I'm going to tell you something. Can I, just, can I just say this today? And this is well, the Lord's just really been, been in my ear in the last couple of weeks about this in my own life and about our church life and, and just church life in general. When you come to church, is this a launching point or a destination? Think about that. Is this a launching point or a destination? Because if Sunday is, is merely a destination, you're missing out on 99% of your Christian life. This is not the destination. This is the launching point. What do I mean by that? If what I do here on Sunday in the worship, in the message, in the small groups, in Sunday school or other discipleship groups that I'm part of, 
If, if that doesn't springboard me and launch me into a deeper understanding and desire and study of God's Word, but this is, the, this is the place I think I ought to get to, we're missing the point of the church. The church was never established to be the destination. The church was established to be the launching point. We come here to get our ears wet. You'll never get all the theology you need. I don't, go sit under Charles Stanley. Go sit under David Jeremiah. Go sit in any church in, in America. You will never get everything you need theologically to live your life for the Lord by sitting in sermons on Sunday or by listening to podcasts or anything else. You know how you get it? By digging in. By dig, well, I just, Mark, I just don't understand. Then find you a translation you can read. Even better, find somebody who's been walking with the Lord for a long time and commit to meet with them once a week for about the next year. Guess what? You're going to be challenged to do that in the months to come. Because I want to tell you something. Where the church, it, it, we hadn't sent the proclaimer out yet, I don't think, but you're going to, you'll, you'll read it in my article on next week when it goes out. Let me tell you something. I believe the church has done a great job of, of, of evangelizing, but I'm going to tell you what the church has done a horrible job at, at helping people walk with the Lord, at helping people learn what it means to be a follower of Christ. Most of you are probably just like me. You were dunking in some water at a young age. You were handed a Bible and said, go be a good little Christian boy or girl. And I'm thinking, uh, and how do I do that? It wasn't until someone late in my life I think that's why I probably considered 24, 25 years old my, when I got saved. I don't, know, I don't know that I wasn't saved at five years old, but I want to tell you what. I was as useless at 25 as I was at five until somebody invested in my life and started to walk with me through the Scriptures and show me and tell me what it means to walk with Jesus. And I'm afraid that there's people sitting in pews all across the land, just like right here today, who, yes, you've given your life to Christ. Yes, you've been dunked in some water. Yes, I believe you probably are born again, but you're no more useful to God today than you were 10, 15, 20, 25, or 30 years ago because nobody has ever walked with you and talked with you and showed you what it means to follow Christ. That's a side note. But here's the reality. Jesus didn't do what he did. He didn't have his body beaten. He didn't shed his blood so that you and I could sit in a pew. <laughs> he did that so that he could save our soul from hell and so that we would be ambassadors for him to tell others that he wants to save their soul as well. That's why Jesus died. That's why Jesus even came, is to give his life for you and me. And when we come to this table, that is the, is the, is the reality that we celebrate.